Hello and welcome to another edition of Cardiac Imaging Agora. In this session, we will discuss the value of cardiac PET in detecting myocardial scar. So again, we go through the same uh, steps, the same recipe to a successful read of a PET scan, a cardiac PET scan, uh, starting with the uh, reviewing uh, the transmission and emission images after you acquire the images and going through all these uh, logical steps and ending up with a, a clinically meaningful report that we can take back to our uh, providers or uh, the requesting uh, uh, physician. So uh, since this uh, study involves the uh, uh, information on the rest, uh, stress, and then an FDG scan, we will start as always with the rest scan. We look at the transmission, transmission and emission images we make sure we have good co-registration of the images here. Uh, and we can see here the ventricle and the uh, uh, emission images and transmission images, meaning the CT and the perfusion images uh, is, are, you know, all the cavities are superimposed. Uh, so we don't have an issue of uh, misregistration. Again, we cannot but notice the presence of bilateral pleural effusion on this, uh, on this uh, scan. We go to the stress images. Similarly, we, uh, we interrogate the uh, registration of the perfusion images with the CT images, and we uh, ensure that they're uh, probably registered. And finally, we do the same exercise for the FTG images, as you can see here. These are the FTG images for this, uh, for this uh, patient. We can look at them in this uh, short axis images uh, or uh, cross cuts across the heart, and then we can look at them transaxially whichever way we want, sagittal plane, we can look at the coronal plane and the transverse uh, plane uh, as seen here in the magnifying, the magnified uh, view. Then we go on to the reconstruction uh, planes for uh, that we choose. You can see here in the rest uh, images in the middle, the stress images on top, uh, the, uh, the software detected the heart properly and put the cross in the middle of the heart, the short axis. Uh, however, in the FDG images on the bottom, you can see the uh, uh, software detected uh, something else besides the heart. We can see this heart here in the upper uh, uh, right corner right here. Uh, probably it's over the liver or some other uh, heart tissue there. So we have to uh, re-adjust uh, this and bring the plane over the heart. Now we have proper registration of the stress, rest in the middle, and the FDG images uh, uh, on the bottom here. The next step is to uh, simplify our life. So I never review the images altogether. I always review the rest and stress first. Uh, so my first task here is to define the presence of uh, ischemia uh, or fixed defects. So we can see here in the short axis, again, displayed in the stress images on top, rest images on the bottom. In the short axis, you can see here a missing part of this donut or uh, this bagel uh, in the heart here. Uh, it's seen better uh, again here in the uh, uh, horizontal long axis where you can see the apex is completely missing. Uh, match defect in the stress images. Again, you can see it here in the vertical long axis, both rest and stress. There is some GI activity here, which is uh, inevitable in patients with, uh, uh, on the rubidium. It's almost uh, uh, present in almost all studies uh, in rubidium images. Uh, it doesn't make your life difficult very often, but sometimes it can. But you can see here this fixed defect again in the apex. And in a, in a normal situation, we will call this a scar, but we uh, learned from other sessions and from uh, our experience that uh, you can never call this a scar. You can call it a fixed defect, and you can only ascertain if it's a scar or hibernating myocardium by going on to do an FTG study. So from this, we know we have no ischemia, but we have a fixed defect in the distal LED territory in the apex. We go to coding these uh, images. Again, you can see here, we can disagree slightly on whether we call this two or three, uh, one or two, but we can all, all agree that we have no uptake in the apex and some of the periapical uh, segments. Uh, this is how we finally agreed on calling it by semi-quantitative analysis with then some stress score of 11, some rest score of 11, and some different score of zero. Some different score implicates or indicates uh, ischemia. So there is no ischemia here. We just have a fixed defect. Then the next step is to review the rest images with the FTG images. So now we're looking for match versus mismatch defect, meaning matched. If we have a defect on the rest images that is matched with the FTG images, we have a defect on the FTG images, and that's the uh, hallmark of what we call SCAR by, by uh, PET. 
So we have here a defect in the rest images matched by a defect in the FDG images, no metabolic activity in that segment in the apex, absolutely none. And you can see here, uh, this is uh, typical of SCAR. Have we had, um, if we were dealing with a situation of hibernation, you can see a mismatch defect where you have a defect in the apex picking up FDG uh, uh, in the metabolic images. This is not the case here. Again, this is a scarred myocardium. You can see beautifully, perfectly matched defect in the apex. Uh, you can see it here displayed on the 17 segment uh, uh, model. Now the rest of the segments, the FDG is not very helpful in a metabolic study done for hibernation because usually you can see variable FDG uptake. The only area we can comment about is the area where we have a defect on the rest in, resting images. This is uh, different in cases where we're looking for inflammation or sarcoid, uh, for example. Again, finally, before I go to report the case, I usually look at all the images combined. So we have the FDG on the bottom, rest in the middle, and the stress on top. And you can see this match defect all across the three uh, sets of images, uh, indicating SCAR and the LAD territory involving the uh, apex. Uh, again, this is how we, it looks on a 17-segment model display perfectly matched effect. It's almost like a fingerprint of the heart. So uh, this, we know that this is the same patient just from looking at, uh, at where the defect is and the fact it doesn't change from rest to stress to FDG. Then the next step is to look at the uh, gated images. So before we do that, we interrogate the acquisition part of it. These are the rest images on this side. The heart rate was 95, beautifully uh, around a nice uh, tight uh, histogram here for the heart rate. In the stress images, this patient's heart rate jumped up to 113. And uh, this is not unusual. This patient has stopped his beta blockers uh, for whatever reason when he came to the stress lab. This is a pharmacological stress test, but he still was rest, tachycardic at rest, more tachycardic post uh, pharmacological stress testing with drug adenosine. And you can see here, uh, this, his heart rate was 113. Again, nice tight histogram. We don't have variability in the heart rate. Uh, fast heart rate is not an issue. Variability can be an issue. So again, remember in PET, we're imaging at peak stress. We're not imaging post-peak. Uh, so all the images here as the patient is still on the camera right after the regadenosine injection. So we're not on, uh, uh, it's not like SPECT where you're imaging again uh, anywhere between uh, 30, 45 minutes uh, later uh, after the peak stress, especially with pharmacological imaging. Then we go to the gated images. Again, we can see these contours are very nice tracking the heart nice and rest and stress images. Uh, EF might be reduced, uh, it's not normal, but it's uh, not uh, uh, very abnormal. It's around uh, 50, 50, uh, 53% here. Again, akinesia of the apex here, as you can see, there is no brightening of the myocardium in the apex indicating uh, akinesia. Then we go to the synchrony analysis. Again, as I showed you before, uh, on the right-hand side, I show you here, a uh, very normal patient with normal synchronous uh, contraction of all the segments of the heart and rest on the bottom and stress and the, and the stress images on top. This is our patient here and the blue depicts the apex, the, the uh, thickening of the apex, rest and stress. And you can see the apex and periapical segment right here uh, is, are, uh, are affected by, uh, uh, they're not contracting normally. So you can see here the apex does not come in and contract the same degree uh, at the same time as the rest of the segments. And that uh, does the, the synchrony of the apex is out of phase of the rest of the segments uh, and does not uh, contract as normally. This is not a surprise knowing that it was an akinetic apex uh, based on gated images. Then we go to the uh, review of the blood flow. You can see here uh, the myocardial blood flow reserve is uh, uh, depressed mainly in the LAD but also in the other segments and globally, the cutoff, is, as we talked about before, is about 1.8 for our lab. That's what we use. It's depressed for all. But just remember here that uh, you have to uh, QA this. There is a QA process. One of the parts of the QA process is look what the check what's the resting flow. The resting flow in this patient was quite high. Usually normal rest flow is about anywhere between 0.8 and 1.2, uh, at least in our experience and in published data. One is usually the number that you're looking at. Here we have a very high resting flow for all the segments. And when you have such a high resting flow, you're not gonna expect such an augmentation. Although we have nice stress flow here, the ratios turned out to be low 
just because you're starting with a higher resting flow. So you have to figure out why is this happening. This can happen in patients who have uh, shunts for uh, dialysis. Uh, it can happen in patients with high cardiac output. In this instance, we went back and looked, and this is the hematocrit and hemoglobin for the patient. This patient was quite anemic when he came to our lab. Uh, and that also explained his fast uh, uh, heart rate at, uh, at rest. So again, when you're reporting flows, you have to remember what you're uh, to QA the rest uh, flows and make sure that they're not uh, inflated based on the high flow status of the patient. The next step is to look at the CT images, uh, look at uh, calcification. This is a patient who's 43 years old, uh, came to the emergency department with shortness of breath, uh, known to have anemia of unknown etiology. Um, but when they uh, uh, examined him, uh, they heard the uh, you know decreased uh, breath sounds bilaterally. Look at a chest X-ray. One test led to the other. Uh, here we can see the pleural effusions, but we don't have any calcification in his coronary arteries. This is a bone view to detect calcification. We look at all the images, the bone, the lung, to make sure there is nothing uh, we're missing in the extra cardiac uh, images. Now we go to report the study again. We have to report the indication for the study right here, as you can see. Uh, then we report uh, what uh, type of test we did, and we report the radiation dose given. In this instance, the DLP is 46 uh, for this uh, patient. Uh, we uh, again uh, report the dose given. We report the rubidium rest, stress, and what dose of FTG, and what was the blood sugar at time of FTG uh, image acquisition. Uh, some clinical uh, data about the patient, height, weight, um, BMI, blood pressure, medications, uh, prior cardiac uh, or prior uh, history, uh, whether they have a cabbage, PCI, pacemakers, uh, valve uh, surgeries, uh, any of these other issues. And then we look finally at the stress uh, physiology, rest uh, images, you have a uh, heart rate of 93, stress 113, again, blood pressure here, uh, dropped with uh, regadenosine, not an unexpected finding as we talked about before, no STT changes. Uh, we look at, we report the uh, EF. Here we, uh, we, EF was slightly abnormal, so we reported it right here. Mildly dilated ventricle, where the wall motion abnormality was present, we call these segments akinetic. Again, I show you here the right ventricle, normal rest and stress, and the volumes and the ejection fraction uh, for, for this patient. Then we go to report the uh, test summary. In this instance, we have no ischemia. This is an abnormal test, no ischemia. Uh, uh, in any territory, then we, uh, given what we talked about before, we uh, coded this area on the FTG as scarred. Uh, there was uh, no hibernation, and we called an area of scar in the territory of the uh, left anterior descending uh, artery as depicted uh, here. We move next to report the final conclusion of the study. This is a study that is abnormal, uh, no evidence of ischemia, no evidence of hibernation, what we have here is we have a medium amount of SCAR, uh, SDS score, we said it's 11. And so those segments represent a, a little bit more than 10% of myocardium, but less than 20% of the total myocardium. Uh, we report this here. Uh, we have no calcification visualizing the coronary arteries, and we report left ventricular size and function, and we report the pleural effusions uh, right here. So this is a 43-year-old patient, uh, BMI in the 20s, uh, presented with shortness of breath, uh, no chronic history of anemia uh, to the emergency department. This is his baseline EKG. Uh, they saw these uh, STT changes, uh, very uh, minimal leak in enzymes. So uh, he was not uh, really presenting with an acute uh, ST elevation MI. The enzymes trended down. So given his anemia uh, and his uh, uh, EKG, uh, the patient uh, was prioritized for a non-invasive uh, strategy. Uh, they got an echocardiogram on the patient to figure out what's going on, why he has this pleural effusion AKG changes. And you can see this is a DFINITY study here with uh, four chamber view on this side and uh, two chamber view on this side. You can see akinesia of the apex. Uh, so they were uh, very concerned about this patient having uh, uh, a prior event uh, or an event uh, at the time of presentation, despite the fact that the size of the, uh, of the wall motion variety here is not reflected by a minimal bump in his uh, cardiac enzymes. Uh, again, you can see here, this is the patient's uh, echocardiogram depicted here 
uh, from four chamber to two chamber to three chamber. And again, uh, the global strain, you can see also mimicking what we saw on the uh, uh, nuclear images, uh, on the perfusion uh, images, the, uh, as well as the gated images, this uh, wall motion mammality and abnormal strain in the apex uh, on the echocardiogram. So based on these findings, the patient were prioritized uh, for a, a non-invasive strategy, went for a PET, and the PET uh, unfortunately did not show any viability in the segments that are akinetic uh, on the echo here. You couldn't tell from the echo here because these segments are not thinned out completely. Sometimes when you're looking at an echo and the, uh, this, the wall thickness is under 0.5 or 0.6 centimeters, it's usually very predictive of scar or poor return of contractile function post revascularization. In this instance, you can see these segments actually are not that, uh, they're not that thin, except for a very, very uh, thin segment, probably at the apex, but it's high, very high to, to see here. Uh, so that's why uh, sometimes you, you're stuck and you have to go down uh, the route of, uh, of uh, you know, advanced study like PET uh, FDG in this instance. You see very thin scarred segments here with calcification. Uh, maybe in those segments, uh, you should not uh, continue on and do a PET because you know that these segments are uh, probably scarred and dead. So this is uh, a, a, a straightforward study uh, illustrating um, uh, basically what we saw, uh, a fixed defect, uh, not matched by FDG indicating scar. Uh, we can see that there is no indication for this patient to continue for uh, to other studies, let's say a cardiac cath, or a coronary uh, investigation, given that we don't have any ischemia and we don't have any hibernation uh, to act on. Uh, with that, uh, thank you for listening. And uh, we will meet again for another session of uh, cardiac imaging Agora. Thank you.